Hello everyone, my name is uh, Jeff Bader and I'm with the North Dakota Geological Survey where I'm the director of the Wilson M. Laird Corps and Sample Library. Uh, today I'm going to discuss the bird bear formation of North Dakota with an emphasis on uh, sequence stratigraphy, which I feel really makes everything uh, much clearer when we're dealing with the core and uh, determining depositional environments, etc. So first I will introduce some general information about the bird bear and then get into a more detailed presentation of the facies uh, identified in core uh, sequence stratigraphy and late Devonian paleogeography and depositional setting. And then finally I will finish off with a bit on the tectonic setting. So bird bear stratigraphically uh, is located between the units that we all are familiar with, the Bakken and the Three Forks. Um, here in the uh, late uh, Devonian part of the Jefferson group. Study area is mainly in Western North Dakota. You can see the cores that I looked at, 16 cores, and uh, mainly in Western North Dakota, but some up into North Central and then into Central North Dakota. So the depositional setting in general, the bird bear was deposited in the Elk Point uh, Epiric Seaway. We can see here this uh, extended uh, from um, basically northwestern Alberta to uh, South Dakota, and then uh, from uh, central Montana all the way over nearly into eastern Dakota based on this uh, Blakey map for the Gavidian period, which is uh, just before a deposition of the uh, bird bear. And what we have here um, is a uh, deposition along a, uh, a broad carbonate platform uh, with fringing shoals and these bioherms that were uh, lateral to the basin and uh, transitioned into the carbonate basin, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, section AA prime going here from uh, southwest to northeast. So here is that cross section. So this diagram just shows a generalized view of the envisioned uh, depositional setting uh, with land to the southeast and then the sea to the northwest in the more distal area. This is very broad a carbonate platform, basically an epiric uh, platform that we really don't have today, extremely flat uh, with a bank on the outer side giving way to the basin uh, to the northwest and then to the Southeast, we have the lagoonal and then the dry type uh, sub subca environment landward. Uh, this uh, uh, bird bear has been uh, broken up into A and B zones based on the uh, kind of the type log for uh, the bird bear. And uh, we have uh, basically these A and B zones was uh, the way we'll be working on it today. And this is really based on sequence stratigraphy and uh, I guess somewhat lithology, but the original designations were for this upper and lower bird bear, which do not correspond to the A zone and the B zone. So keep that in mind. This really is basically on a lithology. So we're gonna use the A zone and B zone because I'm gonna emphasize sequence stratigraphy. So uh, bird bear deposited in an epiric carbonate platform, again, a uh, carbonate ramp uh, and consists of the burrow modeled and nodular uh, units at the base. Uh, these would be the platform deposits of the low stand. And then there was a deepening upwards in the base and we get these uh, transgressive and then uh, regressive as we get the maximum flooding. Uh, and these are open marine uh, units. And then you get uh, shallowing upwards from there. Uh, the high stand deposits moving into these biohermal uh, units that we'll talk about in uh, quite a bit of detail and see in the workshop and then um, moving into continuing high sand into your uh, very shallow units and your uh, evaporites at the top. Uh, sequence uh, is capped by this evaporite in the B zone, so basically just one cycle. And then we have the A zone, which is composed of two or three thin, uh, these uh, carbonate evaporite packages, not very thick total, only about 20 feet. And so now we're gonna look at some of the rocks initially from the general model and the previous work, I realized that these bank faces were easily mappable and the best place to start to orient myself uh, with regards to the stratigraphy, depositional environment, and then ultimately sequence stratigraphy. 
So using that methodology, uh, I started looking at uh, the core, um, basically identifying the bank faces or lack thereof, and then the rest of the core I went ahead and um, described. So four main depositional environments uh, were identified, uh, Sabka mudflats, restricted marine lagoonal uh, bank, as I mentioned before, and then the open marine environment. And so each of these um, facies uh, corresponded well to uh, work done by Mark Yannick and others in 1995. Uh, at first, I didn't look at this paper because I did not want to become biased. And then uh, once I got uh, my information down and, and my interpretation, I went ahead and looked and saw that uh, it did correlate nicely with their work. And so uh, the environments also were then uh, subdivided into these uh, various faces that we'll look at uh, in more detail today in the core workshop. So Sabka faces mainly this uh, nodular and hydrite is uh, what we see there. And we'll see some really nice examples of in the workshop, um, basically deposited subaerially in the upper supertidal environment. Uh, they may also occur though um, uh, distally as basin center deposits as we'll, we'll look at a bit in the sequence stratigraphy part. Uh, proximal areas also include this interpreted mud flat deposit consisting of calcrete or caliche um, for really only saw in one well, number 207, but basically the entire interval is, uh, is this material, and we'll see that in the core workshop. Secondly, we have the restricted uh, marine lagoonal environments. Uh, generally, um, we see these kind of interbedded mudstones and shales of facies association 2A, uh, waxstone, uh, they're kind of ripple cross laminated wavy. Uh, and uh, occasionally do get some burrowing in there, uh, but a quiet environment. Uh, locally, they're fossiliferous, and then we also have uh, uh, dolomitic dolostones in these units. We'll see these today as well in the core workshop, and then they can be uh, anhydritic in that uh, shallow marine environment. Uh, bank faces uh, 3A, uh, these represent the bioharm. Uh, that I talked about that uh, is present in the study area it consists of waxstone to grain stones, uh, but uh, locally mudstone. Uh, we also have the baffle stone and the um, uh, bound stones uh, have been noted. And then uh, stromatoporoids, uh, both uh, laminar, as we see here, and bulbous are kind of the main uh, bank formers. And uh, we also have uh, amphora as well as some uh, coral and uh, occasional brachiopods. Uh, rocks are commonly dol dolomitized, and so you're gonna get really good um, porosity there. And sometimes we see this oil staining, uh, good um, intergranular, intercrystalline, and buggy porosity. And we do see so some anhydrite as nodules uh, within yield fractures, as well as filling these cavities. And so uh, forebank and backbank bases are, are also uh, part of the, the bank system. They are uh, fossiliferous, but not nearly as, as, as much. Open marine, then we get into here, we get these uh, generally mudstones and minor wax stones. Uh, these are commonly burrow modeled, uh, really no traces of bedding. Do you see some fossils, gastropods, et cetera, brachiopods and coral, uh, poloidal and stylolytic uh, with um, trace buggy porosity. And then again, some of these uh, pores are filled with anhydrite. Uh, in some cases, we look at and uh, we may see some uh, basin centered anhydrites at the uh, base of the section. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. And this would just basically, when the basin gets uh, very shallow in water, you might get precipitation uh, of some uh, anhydrites within the basin. We also do have uh, facies 4C, which is the, basically the platform wedge. This is the initial low stand deposits as sea level begins to rise. And we also have some storm deposits as well. So based on all this core analysis, I was able to put together this facies map and uh, basically a, a paleogeographic map using those um, facies that I identified and the depositional environment. So yellow defines really the bank facies you can see extending from the southwest off to the northeast. I believe there was some communication between the open marine to the north into the lagoonal areas to the southeast. 
based on what I saw on well 25688 as well as 21139. We'll see 21139 uh, today. We're going to look at a couple cross sections real quickly. First one goes uh, southwest to northeast, uh, basically along the trend of the, the bank. And then BB prime will go more from the distal environment to the proximal environment in more north south orientation. And this all providing a stratigraphic framework for the bird bear of North Dakota. So section AA prime, as I mentioned, kind of goes parallel uh, along the bank facies. So we can see it does extend the bank facies all the way through till we get over right into here between uh, these two wells and this open marine, I believe, uh, uh, pathway to the uh, Mocha Marine to the lagoons. And so that was open communication, I believe, here. So I don't believe that these connect through here, uh, although we don't have a whole lot of wells in, that have been drilled here, pretty much no wells. And so um, that is speculation, but uh, perhaps there is a reason there aren't any wells there. And so um, moving on to BB prime, again, we can see here uh, looking now more distal. So you go into the marine environment. So these would be the low stands in the blue to the uh, transgressive system track and then the regressive system track moving back into uh, the bank deposits here and so the cross section comes through we can see these bank deposits well developed in the central part of the section thickest to the um, uh, northwest and then they thin as you move to the southeast grading into the lagoonal facies and then off into the uh, very near shore sabka mud flat type environments in well 207. So let's talk a little bit about sequence stratigraphy. I'm not going to get too detailed. Uh, you can look at this uh, at your leisure. It, it's a pretty complex uh, um, diagram here going from times T1 through T6. Um, and we'll break out each of these real quickly in the slideshow. So basically at T1, we're looking at the underlying formation or the underlying sequence. In this case, uh, we would be looking here at the Dupro, uh, but within the bird bear, we do have these cycles. So each time you cycle back, you're going to be looking, sitting on top of a previous sequence. So just keep that in mind. And then uh, eventually that cycle ends. So the middle part of the bird bear, and then uh, you get the three forks on top after the uh, cycling stops. So at time T1, that's the previous high stand deposits and basically, as I said, the underlying sequence or formation. So um, in this case, the Duperdo. So then after T1, you have a significant forced regression and uh, sea level falls or drops. So at that point, T2 represents the falling stage and a low stand combined. After the uh, previous high stand, water depths are very, very shallow. And because of this, most accommodation has been consumed during that high stand normal regression. So even a minimal base level fall leads to a rapid force regression and subaerial exposure of the um, platform top. And then this continues through the subsequent low stand. And then here we start to have, as sea level rises again, very a thin, uh, what we call narrow platform low stand wedge as you begin to get the progradation uh, during the low stand an initial deposition of the bird bear. Um, basin word sedimentation is very minimal, but we do have, due to sediment starvation, uh, the shallow marine water uh, may promote precipitation of basin-centered evaporates, as I mentioned before. Landward, the force regression exposes the platform to karstification and calcrete deposits in, in more uh, arid settings. T3, so you get a slow transgression at this time. Um, carbonate factory will continue to grow. It's starting to flourish and uh, accommodation space is beginning to uh, form, eventually catching up with rising base level during uh, the subsequent high stands we'll see here in a minute. Um, basically, you get the deepening package of the lower bird bear deposits uh, um, as the accommodation is created across this entire carbonate shelf leads to deposition of transgressive, then a regressive open marine carbonates in the basin and then restricted uh, marine carbonates uh, in these uh, lagoonal areas. Then the regressive open marine deposits are subsequently overlain by the bank deposits of the high stand 
where water depth and environment allow for the bank development. T4 represents high stand phase of the current cycle as described for, as we said for T1 for a previous cycle high stand and deposit the high stand normal regression are best for bank development. So now the banks are really thriving. They are doing really good. Uh, the transgression had to be a slow transgression, otherwise the bank would get flooded and the carbonate factory would sh shut off. But we had that slow transgression, creation of accommodation during the uh, slowing base level rise. And as base level rise continues to decline, carbonate production nears base level. And some of the material may get transported off into the, the shallow basin floor. And we'll look a little bit at that, uh, those tempest sites uh, in the core workshop. So base rise continues to slow, uh, carbonate production may reach sea level at the point where the carbonate factory will then shut down and eventually sea level fall during the falling stage of force regression and we get that cycle going again. So um, it will, very fair, we have four to five of these cycles depending on where you are in the base. Cycle repetition is likely due to a carbonate factory shutdown as bank growth reaches sea level and then sea level drop. So some point the cyclicity is terminated and likely related to a significant basin event such as a rapid transgression uh, which drowns the carbonate factory and or tectonism that significantly disturbed basin geometry and then the depositional setting. Uh, each of these leading to filling of the created accommodation space by siliciclastic progradation. Then that's what we see is postulated occurred during uh, the late bird bear time as the Katie and Orogeny began at that time, and I believe the Sweetgrass Arch uh, came up, shutting off the Elk Point Basin uh, through the proto Willison Basin from that open ocean. And this led to a significant change in the climate, depositional setting, and the sediment input, uh, which came clastic from the newly formed Antler origin uh, off to the west, as we can see here for time T6. And this is the beginning of siliciclastic progradation into the basin during the low stand of the three forks. So all of this, I'm not gonna get details of this, but we can put this on a nice uh, sea level curve. Again, you can visit this later. So basically everything I just talked about is abbreviated on here and shown with various time uh, sequences. Okay, in summary then, we have um, a stratigraphic framework that uh, I presented herein that provides a, a foundation with which initial studies may be conducted, uh, particularly as related to carbonate sequence stratigraphy for the bird bear, which hasn't really been done before. Sequence stratigraphy is an important, uh, novel, and modern concept utilized to evaluate sedimentary rocks in terms of base level changes and depositional trends that arise from the interplay between accommodation space and sedimentation. It's a powerful tool and it may be used to analyze local to global sea level fluctuations in sedimentary settings such as the Williston Basin. Uh, specifically, sequence stratigraphy may be utilized in data and model driven hydrocarbon exploration to better formulate and predict uh, these lateral and vertical facies changes involving uh, uh, cyclicity that we did with the bird bear here. Uh, diagenetic trends, uh, reservoir uh, compartmentalization, as well as source rock distribution, among others. And so it's really important to establish your stratigraphic framework and understand your sequence stratigraphy before you start doing any of these uh, other studies uh, in, uh, in your basin. Make sure you know where you are in the basin, both laterally and vertically. So let's now take a look at some rocks. Okay, well, let's now like to take a look at some cores and we're upstairs now, one of the labs where I uh, look at these cores. And so I've set it up here so that we're in the room, we're gonna be looking at basically uh, the way the setup is will be in the uh, state of North Dakota here. We've got the wells in this part of the room will be more to the Northwest. Then we'll move to the, in the central part of the room will be more wells to the uh, southeast. And then in this corner of the room, we're gonna be more even further to the southeast, not the southeast part of the state, but within the map area. And so 
looking at the map here of the northwestern part of the state, you can see that, uh, well, 13698, that's uh, more into the uh, distal area of the uh, study area. And then we come in more into the central part of the area. We'll look at well 5921. And then more to the proximal area is the well 21139 and 207. So basically, we're going to be going from um, more offshore to more onshore, more distal to more proximal. Okay, and so for um, this study area, the first thing I did was when I was looking at these cores and I saw the bird bear, uh, that very nice bank facies was the uh, obvious thing to focus on because it's very easy to recognize. And so for uh, the core workshop today, that's what we're going to do too, is we're going to look at first a core that has a very well-developed bank facies. And then we'll move uh, lateral to that to areas where we don't see the bank facies or it's not as well developed. And what that does is it allows me to, as I mentioned in the previous video, to orient myself both uh, stratigraphically and then help better understand the depositional environment and the sequence stratigraphy. So first thing we're going to start out with then is going to be this well 5921 core. For the cores that we have today, then those four cores, most of these cores don't go all the way through the bird bear. So we don't see the full sequence from the low stand system track through the transgressive track and then the high stand system track. So uh, what we're going to be in most of these cores, or three of the four are uh, starting in the high stand system track. And then one other core, we do have a little bit of the transgressive system track. So just so everybody knows, we're not going to have any of the maximum flooding surface or down into the, um, into the low stand maximum regressive surface as well. Uh, we won't see that, but we'll, uh, I'll point out um, where we are sequenced stratigraphically as well when we look at each of the cores. Okay, everybody, now we're uh, to well number uh, 5921 in the northwestern part of the state, now represented here by the red star. If we go to the log for the bird bear, this is the representative um, gamma ray uh, log that I showed you uh, before. As you can see here, for this chord interval, then for this well, we're looking at going up towards uh, um, near the top of the bird bear and then down toward near the top, but only part of the bird bear is cored. So we're going to be looking at these logs uh, on uh, most of the wells, all three of the four. So we've got the gamma ray, and then we've got the uh, porosity logs, the uh, neutron density, and the uh, density, uh, or neutron porosity and the density porosity logs. And so, um, as I mentioned, we won't be seeing the low stand. We're going to start up moving up into uh, on this, uh, this core will be in the high stand system track. All right, so let's take a look at some of the core. So as I mentioned now, so for the maximum flooding surface, it's going to be down here somewhere. We're coming up into the core. Now we are in to the high stand system track. And so if you look at this lower part of the core, it's uh, pretty homogeneous. And we see uh, the carbonate rock, and we can see this, what is a burrow modeled mudstone. And you can see the burrowing. We're now in the very much open marine facies that I talked about earlier. And so then, as we come up section, we're coming up into uh, what looks like some fossils. Uh, we see a distinct color change. And now we're getting into the uh, bank facies, and we can start to see small amounts of fossils, and you get more and more fossils till you get up into this part of the bank facies where we can see very distinct uh, stromatoporoids coming across through here, and we can see um, uh, coral as well, and you can see that uh, if we have the uh, larger uh, image here, we can also zoom in, and you can see the nice uh, Thamnopora uh, corals and the uh, laminar stromatoporoids. So this is the early part of the bank. So you're going to be in your four bank moving up into your actual uh, central bank where it's going to be dominantly composed of these 
stromatoporoids, because these were stromatoporoid banks. And so as we get into the central part here, we can see some really beautiful laminar stromatoporoids, very uh, large chunks of these uh, fossils. We start to see also some uh, brachiopod uh, fossils as well. If you, uh, again, we have the zoom in, we can bring that in here. And you can see these brachiopod shells in cross section. They're uh, pretty nice, not as many uh, nearly as the uh, stromatoporoids though. We uh, also have uh, a lot of amphipora as we start to get into the central bank and the back bank faces, as you can see uh, in through here. So this well has a very nicely developed floatstone, basically a nice developed bank facies, and this floatstone then is a carbonate, it's a limestone. It has not been dolomitized, but if it were to be dolomitized, you're gonna get some really nice porosity. So this is gonna be the best reservoir rock for the uh, bird bear. So as we come up through the section, all of this is the bank facies until we get into the uh, back bank faces, we start to see, again, less fossils as we get more on the uh, back side of the bank. So we go from the fore bank to the main central part of the bank with all the stromat stromatotoporoid development. And then we get into the back bank, we start to see some really nice uh, amphipora as well as uh, a few more stromatoporoids. But this is the area where you're gonna see uh, more amphipora. And again, as I mentioned, uh, this helps locate itself strat ourselves stratigraphically. So as we come up through the section, we know we're in the high sand system track. We should be shallowing upwards in these cycles. And we move into uh, a little more nondescript units. We can see some uh, bedding through here, but it's starting to look more like what we just saw below the bank with that uh, bioturbated mudstones. And so in these areas, we don't see uh, the fossils anymore. So now we're coming up into our lagoonal facies, and then we can expect to see as we get into the very shallow areas some more anhydrite. And this anhydrite's pretty well developed through here. It's pretty thick. You can see it on the logs real nicely, as I showed in the um, earlier video, and very thick uh, capping uh, anhydrite on top of the B zone. So this is all part of that B zone. We get up here to the top of the anhydrite, and this is the top of the B zone as I have marked here on the core. And we've got anhydrite at the top, and then is our sequence boundary right here at the top. Looks like some sort of erosion surface. And then on top of that, we're back into limestone, mudstone, which is the base of the A zone. So we go into these zones. So what we're seeing here is one full cycle and one full shallowing upward cycle in the B zone. And we see three of those in the A zone. So each are capped with these anhydrites. And on the density curve, you can really see the anhydrites nicely. So there's one, that's that thick one we just looked at, and then three more in that A zone. So that's the 5921 well in the nice well-developed uh, bank facies. So now let's go more offshore and see what we see in well 13698. Okay, now we're gonna move on the map. You see we were at 5921. Now we're gonna move off more offshore to the 13698 uh, well. And remember when I first started looking at these uh, cores, I didn't know necessarily that I was going offshore, that from the previous work that I'd looked at, and things that I'd seen, I had a pretty good idea that I would going um, more into the basin. And so um, once I did that, I thought, well, am I gonna see more of those bank faces or not? That was my main control, as I uh, told you earlier. So uh, looking on the log for this uh, core, again, only part of the uh, bird bear is Cord. We just barely get up into the A zone, so we don't have the upper part of the A zone, and we don't have a significant part of the B zone, okay? This well, you can see here, we have some um, different uh, 
uh, lithologies, and we'll talk about here in just a second. So the response on the density log is a little bit different than we saw at uh, 5921, and I'll talk about that as I talk about the core. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, start with the lower part of the core. So again, we are starting here, maximum flooding surface, and the base of the high sand system tract is again somewhere down here. We didn't get cored into that, so we come up in here. So now we know we're in the high sand system tract, and like the last well, we're kind of seeing more of this burrow model type uh, mudstone again at the very base. We all see are seeing also are seeing uh, some fairly nice fossils, and so you can see in here uh, a little bit more than we saw in the other that was just bioturbated. Here we're seeing some of the actual fossils in the shell. You have a beautiful uh, gastropod here right at the base. So as we come up through the section, based on what we saw in the last core, we want to start to look to see if we see our uh, bank facies. Kind of know where we are stratigraphically now a little bit better based on what we did in 5921. As I come up here, I do see some fossils. I see a nice stromatoporoid here, but it doesn't look anything like what we saw at 5921. As we go further up the section, we're not going to see that beautiful bank uh, facies. So all I'm seeing here are some debris. We got some chunks of uh, stromatoporoids, a few corals, uh, fossil, but mostly shale debris. Uh, scattered about this whole part of the section. And so I interpret this to be some sort of more offshore as we're here uh, now. We're out on the shelf and I believe these are storm deposits that uh, washed some of this material that was present on the bank at 5921, got washed out into uh, deposition further offshore, but again, no bank development here. So we can go up through the section, still seeing kind of that um, mudstone type rock, pretty nondescript. Then we get up and we see uh, a rock here that looks uh, quite a lot different. So on the log, we are right in here and you can see the density and the neutron uh, porosity logs are doing these very sharp spike off to um, the left as you view it. And you can see these rocks here are uh, kind of a lightish, yellowish brown color. Well, these are dolo stones. And these dolo stones are, as you can see, uh, potential reservoirs. And so they did perforate this interval as well as an interval above it, another dolo stone here. And then that dolo stone is capped by a nice anhydrite that we'll see. And so these are going to be your reservoir uh, rocks. And in case uh, this yellowish brown color here that we see in this case of this uh, dolo stone is oil staining that actually um, had from this well that did produce about a thousand a billion barrels of oil from uh, the bird bear. So the key thing here to notice is, and this is what's nice about the bird bear, is we've got source rocks below and then we have the beautiful reservoir and then we have a beautiful cap in these uh, and hydrites are quite thick. They are going to uh, basically be a very nice seal. So we come up, and now you're going to be into your more shallow environment, and that's where you're getting all these anhydrites deposited. So obviously very shallow. We get some very nice nodular anhydrite that you can see here. And this is going to be in your uh, supertidal, maybe to upper intertidal environment. And as I said, that and hydrite is quite thick. Then on the log, we see we come through that anhydrite, and then we see another dolo stone. So here we are um, at the very top of that dolo stone. You can see that um, based on this image here that we'll show you, and you can um, see this light brown, uh, very ripple cross laminated uh, dolo stone. And so this again is uh, a producing interval for the bird bear and then it's again capped by another relatively thick, not nearly as thick as that other one, but thick enough 
a very nice anhydrite. And very easy to recognize these anhydrites. They're, they're um, you can see, especially when you see the nodular anhydrite, very uh, characteristic of a supertidal to um, uh, uh, maybe upper intertidal, but more supertidal and um, a very evaporative type of environment. And so these provide the seals, but the thing we're seeing here that we didn't see in 5921, we're seeing two cycles in the B zone, two uh, shallowing upward cycles. And so that's what we expect to see as we get more out in the basin. When you're on the margins of the basin, you're going to see less of these cycles. When you're more in the central part of the basin, uh, you see more. So you see two cycles here in the B zone where we saw only one cycle in the, A in the um, uh, 5921 well. Now the A zone again has the three cycles. So in this case now we see five total cycles, two in the B zone and then three in that upper A zone. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to go, we went offshore, now we're going to go more onshore and we're going to go to well 21139 to see how that compares to 13698 as we would uh, expect that to be, again, not so much bank facies, but we're now going to be more in the interpreted uh, lagoonal environment. All right, now we've moved from, we were just at 13698 more distal in our environment. Now we moved across to, you know, we're at 21139, uh, basically moving directly south in the uh, northwestern part of North Dakota. And so we're going to be expecting that uh, in terms of the bank facies that we probably won't see any here because this really represents the uh, maximum, uh, very close to the maximum extent of how far the seaway came down uh, during uh, bird bear time. And remember that the maximum extent was into South Dakota, but that was during the earlier period in the Dupero in the Devonian, and then after that, the sea is uh, retreating. And so uh, we would not probably expect any embanked facies as we get down here. And so, as I mentioned, we have this opening, a potential uh, communication with that open seaway from the lagoonal in the bluish green colors to the bluer um, um, open ocean uh, deposits. And so it's curious to see how these compare in terms of the uh, rocks. And so looking also at the log, this was uh, cored again. Uh, actually, this goes all the way to the top of the bird bear. So we have the all of the A zone, and the, or all the, this is all just B zone rock, excuse me. So there's no A zone uh, as we get down further south because it gets uh, eroded away. And so all we have is uh, the B zone, and then um, we're up into the three forks. So we just see that upper and hydrite in this situation in only one cycle. And then going towards the base, we do not get all the way to the base of the uh, bird bear. However, we are further down and we all get to look at a little bit of the uh, transgressive systems track as we're uh, pretty close to the Dupero. And so let's take a look at the core. So starting at the base, Everything here really is very homogeneous starting at the base. We're down in that uh, transgressive system track and you can see this very nice uh, burrow modeled uh, uh, rock, uh, burrow modeled uh, limestone. Because uh, we see these uh, burrows in between, it's uh, very easy to uh, decipher this and it is very, as I mentioned, very homogeneous as we come up. So not a lot of change as you come up, even don't really see too many fossils. But eventually here, we see a real nice gastropod in uh, this environment. So we're coming up more into what appears to be the lagoonal facies, and it's not a whole lot different. So we're coming up from what would be probably uh, the open marine uh, communication uh, signal that we're getting here 
and uh, then we grade up into more of the uh, lagoonal deposits, but they are very similar. So we're looking at a quiet water environment, and that's, I guess, what we would expect as you go on either side of the bank, you're probably going to get very similar environments, although this is going to be maybe a little less quiet in terms of your energy. You're getting back over in here. This is going to be protected by those bank facies, but remember, this is not a significant slope going from uh, offshore in this Epirex Seaway to onshore, so um, the bank doesn't provide a, a ton of protection, but enough to uh, see that the, we're looking at pretty quiet waters with these mudstones being deposited. Okay, so now as we move up through the section here, we're getting into uh, same looking stuff this burrow modeled dark limestone. And eventually you're going to see that we get the high sense system track based on what we see on uh, the log, but it's pretty hard to differentiate it in core because your uh, lithology really isn't uh, changing much. So we don't really see any difference between the um, transgressive system track and the uh, transgressive part of the deposits. And then that transition to the regressive, they're in the lagoon, you're going to see the same kind of environment, so we see the same thing in the open marine environment where you have the transgressive open marine and then moving into the regressive open marine, you just don't see that change in terms of the sequence stratigraphic surface in the core. But as we come up, so again as I mentioned, this rock is very similar, again you see that burrow modeled uh, look and then we get we do see some fossils you can see a very nice uh, brachiopod here and we do have a zone of a brachiopods about five feet as we can see here and but still relatively burrow modeled but what we're expecting here is we have these same um, shallowing upwards or brining upwards sequences we should start to see a little more um, of the very near shore uh, deposits and that's just pretty much what we see we come up we start to see a few of those dolo stones again within the dolo stones we see some uh, ripple cross lamination some evidence of a little bit more wave action however it's not super sig significant we do see some bedding undulatory bedding but it's not uh, uh, that these are a massive wave or a massive about amount of, of energy but we do have some dolo stones and then as we work further up through the section, uh, we see the anhydrite. And we've got some beautiful uh, nodular anhydrite here. Uh, and again, we're looking at our uh, upper supertidal environment and the deposition of these anhydrites. We do also have a laminar anhydrites within this same uh, setting. But again, a good thick package of anhydrites that we see uh, on our log very well defined on the density curve. And so that's going to provide a very good seal. So we saw absolutely no evidence of those bank facies that we saw in uh, 5921. And so we are uh, so far proximal that um, the banks did, did not develop and you're looking at too shallow of an environment. We get up into the Sabka environment and that nice thick anhydrite extends all the way up and we then see uh, the top of the bird bear formation and now for our first shot of the basal of uh, three forks and so what we're looking here as a subaerial unconformity then deposition of the lower three forks is a uh, the low stand deposit for for that unit, and so this is uh, a, a nice section. It's nearly complete. It does not quite have the full bird bear, but just quite a bit, and a good example of the uh, lagoonal uh, facies as well as the nearshore sabka facies. Okay, now we're going to get to our final core. This core is uh, number 207, as you can see on the map. So we're now moving somewhat eastward, but we're still uh, proximal and more proximal than the previous well, 21139. And so 
Now we're expecting that we're getting very much towards the uh, coastline. And so with um, this well uh, 207, we would be looking at Sabka type environment or a mudflat environment as we're getting towards the edge of the seaway. So starting with this section then, we move from the lower part. So Dupero is down here. We do have all of the bird bear. I don't have a log on this because as a number 207 means it's a very old uh, well and there is a log but it's just not really useful. And so um, we'll look at the core here starting from the Dupero and then going up. So basically though what we're seeing here as we get in this environment is you're going to be very close to the shoreline. You're going to be looking at the zones that are uh, karstified or um, we get these calcrete uh, or caliche type deposits that are very recognizable in the uh, supratidal environment as you get very close to the shoreline and where the uh, shoreline has been exposed uh, significantly in that environment. So as we come up through the section we see these Cow Creek deposits pretty much all through this relatively thin section. It's only about 26 feet of bird bear, but it looks completely different from anything we've seen. It's red, so you know that it's oxidized. It uh, has really good uh, vuggy porosity. It is a, a dolo stone. It's been dolotomitized. We see this uh, nice vuggy porosity here, and then the area where we have get up towards the top of the section, a uh, beautiful example of buggy porosity. But some of this porosity has been filled up with calcite, and so although uh, this might make a, a good reservoir, uh, you do have to be careful that that porosity is uh, not occluded. And so here we're looking at a, a picture from um, the core and then zoom in again of that uh, buggy porosity. And then as you go up section, you get up and you hit the very top part of the bird bear, uh, nice uh, unconformity at the top. And then here, unlike the other uh, well that we just looked at at 21139, this is the uh, Three Forks was sitting right on top of the bird bear. Well, over at 207, we do not have any Three Forks. The Three Forks did not extend into that area. So in this case, we have the Bakken formation sitting right on top of the bird bear. And you can see the nice uh, lower Bakken shale, organic rick shale uh, on uh, top of the bird bear. Okay, and so that's uh, what we would uh, expect to see in this uh, proximal mudflat environment. And then that kind of concludes what I have for the bird bear. We'll do a little bit of a summary here in the uh, final segment. Okay, so now as to summarize, we've got this uh, block diagram that you've seen before going from the southeast uh, to the northwest from the proximal environment uh, all the way out into the distal. And this is uh, kind of what we saw here today. So we did the first well uh, in the uh, reef facies, would have been right in this area. Then we went offshore. We saw some of those deposits uh, out on the shelf edge where we didn't see really too much uh, bank development and then we moved more into the lagoonal environment. So we see in the Sapiric Seaway we do have a bit of a lagoon development but we saw we had that um, circulation and open area and open uh, communication with the uh, marine environment into that lagoon and so these facies looked uh, relatively similar to the um, open marine facies that Burrow modeled uh, 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 carbonate uh, limestone that we saw in uh, kind of both environments and the lagoonal environment was really significant with that. And then we looked at a well that was more up in this mud flat uh, zone where we have the development of the calcrete and the caliche in well 207. So the model fits very nicely with what we see in um, the sequence stratigraphy model as well as what we see in the cores. And so when you put all three of those together, uh, we think we pretty have a pretty good invitation. And so that wraps up the bird bear core workshop. And I uh, thank you all for uh, attending and uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye.